Hello and welcome to today's webinar on using cemetery transcripts in your family history research. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, events manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session and this program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist here at American Ancestors. David is an internationally recognized speaker on the topics of genealogy and history. He's authored many articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, the New Hampshire Genealogical Record, Rhode Island Roots, The Mayflower Descendant, and American Ancestors Magazine. He's also compiled 11 books, including a guide to Massachusetts cemeteries. David is an elected fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston and a life member of the New Hampshire Society of the Cincinnati and the General Society of the War of 1812. His areas of expertise include New England and Atlantic Canadian records of the 17th through 21st centuries, American and international military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. So cemetery transcriptions are a valuable resource for all family historians, especially when you're unable to visit a cemetery or when the stones have worn away and are no longer legible. In this presentation, David will discuss the importance of cemetery transcripts and point you toward online and published collections at AmericanAncestors.org, the digital library and archives at AmericanAncestors.org, FamilySearch.org, local historical societies, and more. David will present for about 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions at the end. At any point during the presentation, please type your question in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. There is also a syllabus available for purchase at our online bookstore, and you should find a link to that in your reminder email, and I'll also include it in my follow-up email after today's broadcast. We are recording this event and starting later today, you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn things over to David. Thank you, Kathleen, I really appreciate it. I'm delighted to talk about cemeteries. To me, they are outdoor museums and archives. <clears throat> These are records that are right there in the open air that may give you the clue to where your family comes from Ireland, the actual date of death when there is no actual vital record, or maybe a clue on a middle name that's carved into a gravestone that you can't find on any other record. You may find it in affiliation with their military service or a fraternity such as the Masons or the Odd Fellows that they belong to. They are truly a way of finding a sentinel from the past that brings us closer to our ancestors. <clears throat> Visiting a cemetery, of course, can be done virtually now with such websites as Find a Grave and Billion Graves, <clears throat> as well as all the records that are av available on AmericanAncestors.org, which I'll talk about today. Before you actually visit a cemetery, I always advise it's best to have the location of the cemetery currently in the 21st century. The last thing you want to do is pack up your family on a weekend adventure and take them over using a 19th century map that has old logging roads. Or better yet, the roads have been changed and the names are different. <clears throat> Has the cemetery ever been transcribed? Now, this is one of the main reasons why you want to look at cemetery transcriptions that have been done before. A lot of gravestones, because of the environment that they may have been in, acid rain, uh, neglect, vandalism, may have caused the inscription to be, well, almost impossible to read that were very difficult to read. If you have a transcription that we have at NEHS that so was done in 1910, that's going to be a lot clearer to read than one that is from 2022. Now, when you also go to the cemetery, you also want to find out what the cemetery office hours are. A lot of cemeteries, especially modern urban cemeteries, are huge and have tens to thousands of gravestones. The last thing you want to do is get there and find out, one, the gate's closed. You can't get in anyways. 
or two, the cemetery is so massive that it would take you days upon days to wander around. And then you have the possibility there may not even be a gravestone for the relative you're looking for. Call the cemetery office if it's a larger cemetery or the municipality, usually a parks and recreation or a cemetery office in that community will often know the who, what, and where for that cemetery and especially the hours. Plot cards and locations of graves we'll talk about as well, because in a larger cemetery, there may be a one uh, place that has a monument for the last name, and then the plot card will show you where the individual burials are, even if they're not footstones. There are also going to be rules and regulations. When are the cemetery gates open are important because I actually have been in a cemetery in Massachusetts on a Sunday afternoon out with my car wandering around taking photographs only to turn around and come back and the gate was locked. It was fun to scale that cemetery gate, find a police officer in the days before cell phones and tell them my car was locked in the cemetery and I was trying to break back in. So they had to get someone to unlock the gate. So knowing the cemetery gates is very important and sometimes uh, there may be no uh, trespassing on certain days and hours are important to know too. Now, photography seems like a no brainer that you should be able to take a photograph of a gravestone. It's in the open air, right? But some cemeteries are actually have rules. If you are not related to the person in that particular plot, like it's not an immediate ancestor or immediate uh, family member, then you are not allowed to photograph other. The free for all that Billion Grave and Find a Grave have has been a benefit to all of us, but some cemeteries have rules about privacy. Now, grave rubbings. What was very popular in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, not so much uh, frown, are smiled upon now in the 21st century. A lot of times grave rubbings can do harsh damage to a stone or even cause them to fall and break. Now, my personal love of cemeteries goes back 35 years ago. I was working as an intern at the Massachusetts State Archives and I worked on the reference desk. A lot of people would ask about cemeteries in Boston. So I decided to compile a list. And then I decided to expand it to Suffolk County and my neighboring county of Norfolk County where I lived. And I decided to do Middlesex County, Bristol County. And my Rolodex, which is similar to the one I had right there, built so big, I needed three Rolodexes. So this Rolodex allowed me to be able to quickly tell a person where the cemetery records were, because not all of them have offices. If you've been to a historic cemetery, you may not find anything but maybe a tool shed. Uh, so you needed to know the contact information, or maybe when the cemetery started, or alias names, because vital records may give it one name in the 19th century, and it may have been called something completely different by the middle of the 20th century. Also, cemeteries move. Sometimes cemeteries are sites. So this is my goal, was to find all the cemeteries in Massachusetts. Now, it was the first time anything had been compiled like that before. So 20 years ago, when we did the first edition, obviously, I collected a lot of, oh, you forgot this cemetery, or you might need to add this one. Well, here's one that you may not know about. So in 2009, we did a second edition. That is followed by more corrections and additions in 2018 for the third edition. And now you can actually get it as an ebook edition. So you can take it with you on your tablet and you're on the road with the information on what's in my book. It is a page for every town, in some cases, multiple pages. Here we have Burlington. And the reason I've added the date the town was incorporated is because of the first cemetery listed. Now, Burlington was incorporated in 1799. So you would think every cemetery had to be 1799 or later. Well, actually, it was incorporated from the town of Woburn, as you can see the parent town below it. Now, the first cemetery I have listed here is the Old Burial Ground, a.k.a. Precinct Burying Ground, from 1736. Now, why would a cemetery be from an earlier date if the town only incorporated then? It's because it's from the town of Woburn. That section of Woburn dotted off and became Burlington. So when you're looking for your community, your ancestors and say if you had people from Woburn, you may want to find out what towns separated from that community and are newer named towns now, such as this one for Burlington. So when you don't find your ancestors in Burl uh, Woburn, you know you might want to look in neighboring towns like Burlington. What I've also included are the alias names. And if you've ever been used 
uh, the TAN books in the Massachusetts Vital Records prior to 1850, you may see that the sources include GR numbers. This is the gravestone record number that is included right there as a source because sometimes the vital records in the TAN books, the official vital records of the Commonwealth to 1850, didn't come from a record, but actually came from a gravestone. Uh, we also have included here the manuscript call numbers for NEHGS. And I also uh, went forward and went to the second place to find great Massachusetts cemetery transcriptions. And that is at the DAR Library. The ladies of the DAR for well over 100 years have traveled all over the nation copying old gravestones. And some of the transcriptions they did back in the 19 teens and 20s, you can't really read some of those stones anymore. So it's a true treasure. Remember, not everyone had a gravestone. I have plenty of ancestors that lived in the 19th, 18th, and 17th century that I can speculate where they'd be buried because there's a cemetery about that age in that community, but they don't always have gravestones. And also in the 17th and 18th century, there won't be an office for the cemetery. There may be a sexton's record that records that the person was buried in the churchyard. It's not going to say exactly the plot number. So Maybe you want to take a look further into the burial and church records on earlier cemeteries. I'd also look at those old cemetery transcriptions because the stone that stood in 1905 may not be there 117 years later. Gravestone transcriptions. Now, are you ready to transcribe a gravestone? There are a variety of different transcriptions available, not just verbatim. And I'll get to the best way, in my personal opinion, how to do it. Here's an example of a cemetery transcript, and this is actually one of the ones from our collection. There was no standard rhyme or reason early on, but we're grateful that people did transcribe these gravestones because a lot of them, again, are not legible and some are broken now. This is actually a typed abstract of gravestone information arranged alphabetically. Because, you know, of course, everyone is buried alphabetically in the cemetery row by row, right? So in this case, somebody went through and transcribed gravestones in this case, it was a small family cemetery, so majority of them are probably Bosworths, but you may find other people, but they're going to be alphabetically in order. Now, the other problem with this, chances are the gravestone inscription doesn't have last name, comma, first name. So that's not a verbatim transcription. That's a way of alphabetizing it and making it in alphabetical order, even then secondly by the given name. You also get the dates. And um, well, it may not exactly have the wording just like that. So you might want to go to the Bosworth Cemetery in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, and run this list and see how many of them you can still read. And also maybe take a picture and do a full transcription. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Here's another example. Now, these aren't cemetery transcriptions. These are transcriptions, but these are transcriptions from the burial records. If you look in the left-hand column, the first one is the burial number. These are arranged then by the fourth column by the date of death. As you can see, these people are dying in May and June of 1855. Now, they're not all buried together because the next column gives you the lot number. Lot 632 is preceded by 583 and 114 and so forth. And these are the locations of the burials throughout a larger cemetery. It has the name of the individual and their age. In this case, the person's gravestone says uh, maybe something different than what's on the record. The record says she was 48 years eight of age when she died in 1855. The gravestone might say she was 48 years, four months, and 12 days. So these are typed abstracts in order of burial. Now, here's an example that was done in the 19th century, and this is a handwritten abstract arranged by Cemetery Row. So they're going row by row in the graves and writing down as they found each gravestone. As you can see, in this case, they're not alphabetically in order, or they're not in chronological order. Old cemeteries are arranged in such a way that usually husband and wife are buried near each other and children perhaps even nearby, especially if they were young. But sometimes cemeteries were dotted in such a way that they were buried in the next available spot. So as you can see on this, we go from the Crosby to the Baldwins to the Bacons, back to the Crosbys, uh, and then another Crosby and so forth, and then back down to the Baldwins. The, on the right-hand column, there were notes now, on some of these, we're getting just simply the age, the date of death, and the name. 
Now on the right, we know that John Crosby, who died in 1834, has the Sons of the American Revolution flag marker. Well, at least he did back in 1910. Again, transcriptions like this are useful because you may find that someone was a Rev War or a Civil War veteran that doesn't say it on their gravestone, but somebody had known it back then and did a flag marker. So maybe you have some veterans you're not aware of in your community. The next Francis, who dies in 1729, we know on his stone that he is the son of Mr. John and Mrs. Abigail Crosby, because that's part of the inscription. And then even further down, Sarah Baldwin is the wife of Ensign Thomas Baldwin. And then uh, this is where you're going to find notes that may even say about the condition. And the condition 100 years ago may be a stone that doesn't even exist anymore. So these transcripts are really a treasure indeed. Now, this one is a curious one, and I think that this is obviously done by someone who had a genealogical spin behind transcribing the cemetery. So the George Cemetery here has a Thayer Allen. He was born 17 January 1783, dies April 16th, 1844. And it's very typical in 19th century stones to see a full date of birth and a date of death, and not just the date of death and the age calculated reverse, like they might say he died the 16th of April, 1844, and that he was X amount of years, months, and days old. Hence, they get you the calculation that way. Well, it's even possible in the 19th century that an adult might have his parents written on the gravestone. Uh, but the idea that his parents' date of marriage five years before he was born is carved on the gravestone seems almost impossible. The next line uh, is a little chronologically incorrect. It mentions his wife, Polly Bullard Thayer, uh, having a gravestone. She was born in 1786, died in 1866, but it would be impossible for them to be married in 1906 since they were both died the previous century. So obviously that was a marriage that occurred in 1806. So this overzealous genealogist went to the bother of transcribing gravestones in the George Cemetery and provided additional information that makes it even more valuable for us as genealogists to use as a resource. What you have to be certain is that some of these stones are not going to actually have all of this information on it, but they obviously did their homework. <clears throat> Now, this is a cemetery transcription example typed in cemetery row order. Now, by the time we get to the 19th and early 20th century, granite gravestones are the norm. Uh, there are a lot of marble stones still being used. We start to see slate gravestones fall on the wayside, hardly ever used unless it's a previous one that has a new inscription. And you may just find the name of the person, the year of their birth, and the year of their death. Uh, then it might indicate a family member is his wife or children, et cetera. So is this transcription done as abbreviated or is that what is actually on the stone? So in the Cordes family here, Fernando and Nelly and uh, their children have just the year of birth and the year of death. Now, if I read the gravestone, maybe there's a full inscription for Fernando that has his date exactly in 1911 and maybe even his birth or it could just be this abbreviated version. Again, use this as a clue. Now, for additional notes, we know here that Dwayne Aldrich down at the bottom, 1848 to 1913, he was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic Union Civil War Veterans Post, number 176 in his community. So that might give you a clue about him being in the Civil War, fairly young Civil War veteran. And there may be more records to find in regard to the GAR, as well as Civil War and pension records, et cetera. So these abbreviated gravestone data makes you really want to go back and make sure there's not more that meets the eye. Now, in the 19th century, people would get a little more creative. This is almost verbatim. You notice here, Charles W. French, next line, born May 2nd, 1810, next line, died July 5th, 1876, and so forth, has to the right in brackets, that's the face of the monument. It also says the poetic and biblical epitaph that occasionally is accompanied to some of our early gravestones from the days of slate stones all the way right down to granite. Some of the earlier ones in slate or in marble, they tend to wear off fairly uh, easily because they're very 
light inscriptions. Also, sometimes stones will sink into the ground and you may not find that poetic epitaph at the bottom because it's now five or six inches deeper than it was years ago and it's basically sunk. Now, the other thing about this inscription, it, we now know what's row by row in theory, but we also see the foot markers. There's a foot marker for father and mother, that there are two small stones, uh, and then there are also other additional stones for children. Now, this is a great way of doing it, and we can actually probably read the stone a little bit easier having this information, but is it exactly verbatim? We wouldn't know unless we're standing in front of it. So the sketches, I think, really add a nice little touch. Now, this is a verbatim transcription with a loss of the order of the original transcription on the stone. So in this case, we've given the last name of the individual to the left, so they're in alphabetical order this way. But here's the inscription. For instance, Julia Ann, wife of Charles H. Bebby, who died April the 30th, 1869, aged 52 years. Well, is that all the top line on the top of the gravestone? And is that second line all of that? Well, probably not. It's probably broken up with Julia Ann, next line, wife of Charles H. Bebby, next line, died, next line, April 30th, 1869, last line age at 52 or something similar to that. In this cemetery in New Lenox, Massachusetts, they did go the extra mile to transcribe these gravestones so we can find them uh, with the wording on it, but we may not know exactly how it appears on the stone again until we go there and do a new transcription or find it online. This example are gravestones, abstracts that are arranged alphabetically, and each gravestone is assigned a number. Well, in this case, it's a grave number that was assigned either because it's referring to a lot or maybe a corresponding map. So we see all the different people here. We have Abigail Adams, not the president's wife. Uh, this one is the wife of a Jacob Adams, Deacon Elijah Adams, and so forth. And we have the dates on the stones. And again, it's abbreviated because I don't think any of the gravestones there in continuous order would have just D period for death. So again, not verbatim, but it is transcribed and does give a grave number, which may be a clue to a map that may exist. And this is an example of a cemetery map that you might find with gravestone numbers accompanied, or it might be something you might create yourself, maybe using graph paper or a big poster board to try to figure out where each gravestone is as you photograph them and transcribe them and put them online, making it easier for people to locate. Now, one thing, if you are going to make a map, make some part of the map with a direction of uh, this case going west, this case, it's showing you where the road is, or maybe a large cenotaph monument, uh, one of those larger markers. It stands out uh, in the case of a smaller stone elsewhere, or maybe a tree. Uh, and now, of course, your map may be used 100 years from now, so that tree may not be there. So looking for those larger monuments might be the key. But a map is a wonderful clue. And we do have these at American Ancestors in our collections at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Another way of cemetery transcriptions are the advent of the newspaper. The Boston Evening Transcript uh, was a genealogy column that ran for many, many years, including in it occasionally you get columns that had gravestone transcriptions in them. So we can find various transcriptions of gravestones in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, here is a verbatim transcription with line breaks. That's that forward slash that you see with a web address from time to time. And so we have Mary slash wife of slash Thomas Mortimer slash died slash the date slash AE for the age 60. Now, the next grave down has a cross on it, has IHS, the name of the person born in Longford, uh, in Longford County, Longford, Ireland, died March 15th, 1872, age 34, Y for years, four months, 22 days. Now, this 
may be something that you would hope to find in your research, because if that grave is hard to read, you could almost now go and have a new stone carved with the order of the transcription verbatim. So how do we start doing this? Let's take a simple military gravestone for someone that may be buried, like say for instance, the Arlington National Cemetery. If we went in and we wrote down each line that appears on the gravestone, we're going to go in and have the details right like that. Well, that's a lot of typing. So that idea of putting the line break, that forward slash, allows us to have the inscription on, instead of multiple lines of text, just on three lines of text. You get the same thing. And note here that all of the inscription is in capital letters. So if they were in lowercase, you could put it that way. On older stones, you might see superscript letters uh, like Yi uh, or Jonathan, J-O-N-A, small a, superscripted. And you can capture it verbatim on how it looks. So that's how I do it. And as you can see from the previous slide, it's not like something I came up with. It's been done for a long time. So preserving the exact gravestone inscription, here's a gravestone of Major George W. Dutton. We have the photograph of the stone that we've already done. So we've got that and now we can transcribe it. Where? Well, you can do it in the cemetery in the heat of the summer, or you could do it from your photograph, which is what I would have done here. And I could take all of that inscription. And if I went line by line, I would do it just like this. This has all the punctuation accordingly. including the name and the military mark for his division right there. Now, again, that's a lot of text, especially it's almost like half a sheet of paper just to get that part of the stone down. So you take the same information and you supply it in a few lines like that. Now, that's nice, but how are you going to make it pop out more when you type up your transcription or maybe put it on a website? What I would suggest is taking that same transcription and maybe making the line breaks in a different color, especially if you have it as an online. So those line breaks are now in red. You may also bold the names so they pop out and also make it easier for you when you go to index. How about an older gravestone? Here's a photograph I took of Deborah Sampson Gannett's gravestone, Deborah Sampson posed as uh, Robert Shortliff during the Revolutionary War and was a pensioner in the American Revolution. So how do we do Deborah's stone? Well, Deborah has a couple of different things. On the top line, her name is completely in bold and it's actually a little bit more darker. So it's doing a bold color. The next line, wife of, it's an italic. So I can make italicized font. Then I do Benjamin Gannett. His name is an italicized, but it's a name, so I bolded that. Then I've got the rest of the date, and it's all italicized. The only thing that's in regular font is her name in capital letters. So I could do that fairly simply. Instead of having six lines, I can do it all with three, and I could do it with two, but I've also included the stone condition, a slate gravestone with a carved weeping willow tree within a circle. So you can add some notes that actually make it easier to find that inscription uh, in the stone. So if that stone ever wore down, we know what's on the inscription, but maybe that weeping willow would be the clue as to where Deborah's buried. Town and local county histories are amazing. And in the 19th century, such as this history from Dunstable, Massachusetts in 1873, the idea of recording verbatim transcriptions for gravestones was even going on nearly 150 years ago. Now this has the inscription of a gravestone for quote, our mother, Catherine B, widow of the late John Cummings, who died September 23rd, 1859, aged 78 years, eight months, and then you get the poetic epitaph below. Again, these are the ones that usually tend to fade first. So having an inscription of what it said 149 years ago is tremendous. So these 19th century town histories, take a peek at them because one, they'll tell you where the cemeteries are. And in some cases like this, they'll tell you what's on the gravestones. Another place to look 
or the work that maybe the scouts in your town did, or maybe the WPA, or maybe the town cemetery department, maybe they created an alphabetical list of all the burials. Now you can see here the dates are obviously abbreviated or being calculated dates of birth based upon the age. And then there's other information as well, including the uh, gravestone number that has been assigned for the location, which probably corresponds to a map. In the pre-1850 Massachusetts vital records, I had alluded to the fact that in my cemetery book, I had went through and I pulled out all of the GR numbers and the GS numbers uh, that are in the vital records and told people town by town what cemetery it is in modern terms. The tan books were published in most cases 100 to 120 years ago. And a lot of those cemeteries have different names and the records may be a little hard to uh, locate. So these inscriptions may be the only clue you have. So when you look at it, remember the death records that have these references, GR is for a gravestone record, and some used GS for a quote, gravestone record, two words instead of one. So you may find that with an associated number. And at the beginning of the book, it will tell you where the cemetery is located. And then turn to my cemetery book if you happen to have it available. And it will give you the address, the telephone number, or the uh, transcriptions that exist uh, for that cemetery completely. Published cemetery proprietor list or a clue. Now, they're an alphabetical list of the plot owners. That doesn't necessarily mean the person is buried there. You may own a cemetery plot. I'm sure if you're watching this presentation, you're not currently buried there. So the same case with these earlier lists, maybe somebody moved away or sold the lot or got remarried, but it gives you about the location of the plot with the number and the path name. It also gives me the dimension of the lot, how many square feet it was. So maybe perhaps it will also tell me when it was purchased. Sometimes they even tell you the amount of burials in each plot, like it's a six grave lot or a 10 grave lot, et cetera. The Boston gravestones through the work of the Boston Historic Graveyard Initiative with people like Kelly Thomas, who has been at the head of it for many years, have done tremendous work to go through the Boston cemeteries and do these um, transcriptions of sort of the name, the date, and the condition. Knowing the condition of these stones has allowed us uh, to be able to have them preserved and conserved uh, in cases when they have fallen down or been broken. And of course, the great location with maps serves us for a way to find them again. Maps are so important, especially in these older cemeteries when the stones are broken or fragmented. One place that you may have had your ancestors were in the old almshouse of the poor farm. Poor farm cemeteries exist, but they were generally met, marked by wooden markers or field stones, and sometimes not even that. The case of poor farms, where are the records? Well, the pauper records might be with your town or historical society or public library. The almshouse cemetery was often in one town. It's for people who generally could not pay to be buried in the regular town cemetery unless they had a poor farm lot in the cemetery itself. Mark gravestones? No, well, not really. In most cases, if anything, they had a granite boulder that may have marked where the grave was. Location of records? These are tougher to find because they may have just buried the next person where the person two weeks ago was buried because that's the next available spot in that little cemetery. NEH just has plenty of manuscripts. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot for anything with poor farms, but we're always looking for donations for collections. So if you know of where some of these records might be, please let me know and I can let an archivist know if perhaps there are a possibility we can get them. Published histories are also tremendous because it will allude to where the poor farm is located. In this case, what you're seeing here, those rectangular marks are grave shafts dug from an archeological report. This is the Hudson Poor Farm where they did a survey to determine where the burials were uh, in the course of this cemetery had been basically lost. Any HGS call numbers? Well, we're gonna talk about manuscripts uh, that we have uh, throughout the course of this lecture. As you've seen, I've talked about different transcriptions, but you might find different call numbers. Now, you might find the Akushnan Cemetery is under an old classification for MS for Massachusetts, ACU for Akushnan, and one because it's the first transcription that we have. 
You may also find it as MS-70, another old classification we used, and then MIL for Milbury and 120 for that particular assignment for that collection. But typically now we've transferred a lot of these old call numbers. So if you have it, something that was written down by your grandparent or something you did maybe 20 years ago, keep in mind, you'll probably find them with a new call number such as F74, B27, T47, 1997, using Library of Congress call numbers. Our manuscripts itself will also have MSSA, MSSC, and MSS numbers as well. So our old books have old call numbers, uh, and the newer ones will have the Library of Congress. Let me do a tour of the graves, if you will, to kind of give you an idea of what gravestones existed in uh, the early days right through the 20th century. What you're looking at here is the broken fragments is actually a few pieces. Some of the back actually is separated as well of the earliest dated 17th century gravestone from New England. When they were putting in the replacement stone for Barnard Capon, who died in 1638 and his wife in 1653, they found fragments of an earlier stone in the ground. Obviously somebody had transcribed it years ago, so they knew what was on the stone, but they found these fragments and over 125 years ago, they gave these fragments, instead of just leaving them in the dirt, they gave them to NEHGS. So we're very honored to have the oldest dated gravestone from 1638 in our collection. That keeping in mind, Early gravestones in Massachusetts, the most of them don't date any earlier than the 1650s. Before that, they used wooden markers, field stones, or sometimes they weren't marked at all. Wooden markers, of course, were not going to last very long. And of course, with frost, field stones can tend to sink. And if they didn't have any marking on it, you might walk by it, not even realizing someone was buried underneath there. This stone in my personal estimation, is something that dates from the 16, late 1660s to 1670s or even a little later uh, because that marker is too thin to have been from 1638 or 1653. In the early mark gravestones of the 1630s, um, many of them would be ones that were put as memorial cenotaphs or replacement stones like the one you see here now. The winged death head of the 18th and also the 17th century is emblematic of old New England country cemeteries or even ones you'd find in a city like Boston. This idea of the winged death head bringing death into everlasting life uh, is something you might see on a stone. You may also see an hourglass on it with wings, whereas time flies. So this gravestone here for Josiah Levitt in 1717 doesn't have a lot of information. It surely doesn't have his parents or his parents' state of marriage on it. But this is a true piece of modern historical art from the 18th century and obviously a genealogical treasure. Sometimes gravestones are damaged. And this is one of the reasons about doing rubbings of slate stones. Slate stones are layered rock very slim microscopic layers that if you push on it occasionally those layers can pop off well this one didn't have a gravestone rubbing this is actually an injury that occurred in the early 19th century when a gale storm blew a beam off of a barn that was being built across the street and smashed the stone in half we know from historical records that this stone was actually repaired by these bronze uh pieces here and screwed together. Luckily, that's the case because you may just simply have 490th year of his age. And where would the top part be? Could be buried in the ground, could have been discarded or put on a field stone wall years ago. So we're glad that that one was saved nearly 200 years ago. Cherubs or death head portrait stones also show up and you find these in uh, New England cemeteries, as well as other parts around the nation. And these were often emblematic of maybe what the person looked like. And there are certainly portrait stones that actually have uh, collars of clergymen or judges robes or may have been a child, but sometimes they're cookie cutter. Uh, there's a cutter 
of gravestones, a carver of gravestones rather, in Newbury and Newburyport, Massachusetts. And when I first found Anna Longfellow Poor's 1792 gravestone with her curly locks and cherub-like face with her wingstone, I thought for sure I found something that looked like her before she died. Until I went to a neighboring cemetery and found four or five with the exact same cherub's face. So, so it might be nice to think it might be your ancestor, but do your homework. You may find out it's a similar pattern that same stone carver used. Sometimes the cherubs are for multiple children. In this case, uh, two small children are buried in this cemetery uh, in Sharon, Massachusetts, uh, with uh, three flowers underneath of it. And truly, the DNA of a gravestone is the carving of the stone itself. I strongly suggest, if you have a chance, to look in the probate files of your ancestors, because in the probate inventory, it may mention bills to the from the estate paid out, including for the cost of carving a gravestone. You may get the carver's name. Now, there's a great website for the Association of Gravestone Studies, uh, and they are wonderful. Uh, gravestonestudies.org will actually take you to their website, and they have great tips on both cleaning gravestones uh, and preservation, as well as many gravestone art forms. So if you have a gravestone, you're curious who carved it, they may be able to help you with that. This gravestone from 1776 doesn't have a skull and uh, wing skull. It doesn't have a skull and crossbones. It doesn't have anything with a cherub's head. It's just simple scroll work. So the unique signature of this carver, we can tell because this person's actual gravestone is recorded in his probate. So we know who carved it. And we can look for other stones and know that they were probably carved by him as well. Sandstone gravestones are hardest hit by the environment, right next to marble gravestones. Sandstone are typically found in gravestones in cemeteries in such a Western Mass, Connecticut, upstate New York. And these stones were readily available because sandstone could be quarried. The problem is the nature of sandstone with microscopic fissures that are in the stone itself will allow water to get behind them. And of course, what happens in New England in the wintertime, frost and ice, will sometimes cause that stone to eventually pop and wear off. This is obviously a gravestone. I would not advise to do a gravestone roving of ever. Marble and limestone gravestones are also very uh, porous. In fact, the case of most of marble gravestones, when they look very sandy, it seems kind of awkward because you've probably been into a church or a building that has a fine marble fireplace or plaques on the wall. Well, these all looked very shiny and smooth like that, similar to what you would find with a military gravestone. As we look to the left to the right here, we could see that the stone on the left has darkness in it, and the one in the middle is because of pollution has sucked into the pores of the stone. Why is the stone wearing away? The clear sheen of the marble stone now being removed will cause the small quartz crystals of the marble itself, the microscopic crystals will start falling off or we call sugaring, will make it more of a rough sandy appearance. Again, these are fragile pieces of our history. Photograph and try not to do rubbings uh, if you can help it. Another type of gravestone that you may find in your travels as I did uh, in Pembroke, Massachusetts, were cast iron gravestones. These were ones that were made to honor order. So you could order them up, they would be cast with the names in it, and then they would be placed in no different than you would a lawn sign for your pol political ad that you're supporting in your community. So these metal stones aren't in a, uh, a concrete uh, foundation. They don't have a granite foundation. They just slid right into the ground. And so these are uh, found both in Europe as well as in America, and they're quite unique. And of course, the one slight problem is they do tend to rust. The best gravestone, in my personal opinion, are granite gravestones, where you can have a carving such as the links of the Odd Fellow marker on the left hand side for the Briggs family, or this highly polished gravestone right here for the grandson of Deborah Sampson, who I showed you her gravestone earlier. That polish is as good as it was back when it's placed there for his wife, Harriet, in 1906, made out of Quincy granite. 
Modern gr granite gravestones as well tell the test of time. In case of my own parents, I put the gravestone for my mother and father with their full dates of birth and death on the back, including my father's nickname, which he went by more than his first name his entire life. Keeping one thing in mind, we are standing in the 21st century with visual evidence of flat markers, such as I have for my dad here. Every uh, time for his birthday or when I'm going there to put flowers for various times of the year, Memorial Day, I will clean around the gravestone and I will uh, put flowers by the headstone. If these gravestones, the footstones, are not cared for, grass will, as you probably seen, will grow up around them and eventually grow over the stone. I would imagine probably in less than 100 years, many of the families that have, well, uh, moved on or maybe forgotten about their great-great-grandparents may find that they have to dig a little to find these markers, such as these flat markers now. In search of a tomb. Tombs are obviously pretty obvious when you can find one with your na family name carved right upon it. And this one for the Belcher family uh, at the Evergreen Cemetery in Stoughton has three members of the Belcher family inside and actually has uh, nobody else intended to be buried there because the family died off. But these ornate uh, tombs with ionic columns are beautiful. But you might find one of these in your community. And you might think to myself, is that a tomb for burials? Well, it was temporarily. In colder climates in the winter months, the mechanical equipment that is used now to dig a grave was not present. So you may find a receiving tomb that was uh, used at one point to store the bodies in the wintertime or now used to uh, store just the cemetery lawnmower equipment. You may also find a 19th century family tomb, such as this one. And this is for uh, a family that had purchased this back in the 1830s. If you open up that door, it would lead to either a wooden set of stairs or granite stairs that go down to a vaulted room where caskets were stacked on shelves. No more different than what you would find as bunk beds. And uh, the idea of these rooms tombs would fill up, caskets would eventually be put on the floor, etc. So it would be quite congested. So a lot of times these tombs were disused, their doors were welded shut when they were no longer used, or in some cases, in the case of this family, it's empty now. They moved them to another cemetery. Using vital records to locate tombs might be something that would be useful for you, especially if you're looking in urban areas. So in the statewide Massachusetts vital records that you could find on American ancestors, if I was looking for the burial of my uh, great grandfather's younger brother who died at a year old, Charles H. Poor back in 1850, I could find out that he's male single, that he uh, was born in Boston, who his parents are, and that he died sadly from convulsions. It doesn't tell me where he's buried. For instance, in Massachusetts, statewide vital records don't include the place of burial in exact places until the 1890s. In a lot of cases, it will say in the 1880s, the place of residence, the place of death, and the place of burial, but only by town. Now, if you turn to the local record, in this case, the city of Boston's records, I was able to find that same death. Charles H. Poor gave me the actual address he died at at 24 Piedmont Street told me that he is buried at 11, 111 Central Ground. Well, with a little bit of sleuthing, I figured out that Central Ground was the central ground on the Boston Common. And it said here, the undertaker, F. Smith. Well, F. Smith was in business with Martin Smith, his brother. Franklin and Martin Smith had a great business idea. They would buy tombs throughout Boston and sell them to their customers. Tomb 111 on Central Bearing Ground is owned by Martin Smith, the undertaker, who was brothers with the same person who handled my great-grandfather's brother's funeral in 1850. Well, this massive tomb, which entrance is in front of the, uh, the inscription here, would have probably held anywhere from 25 to upwards of 100 caskets, depending on the size of the burial. In some cases, they were rearranged. In some cases, tombs were even cleaned out and consolidated. But that's an eerie talk for another day. Lot cards and plat maps. 
Here's an example of a cemetery plot map. This is from Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this is for the family of Miriam S. Shattuck. The Shattuck family is very important to us at NEHDS because our first vice president, Lemuel Shattuck, uh, was buried there in 1859, and so were members of his family. This shows a staircase going up to the actual family plot, the central gravestone and granite, it followed by other granite markers that are marked here with the numbers associated to where each burial is in the burial shaft. And this, uh, these notes were checked in 1925. The one thing about cemeteries, you want to really have a map because your last time you want to do is go to a large cemetery like Mount Auburn and drive endlessly around looking for the spot itself. Well, someone in your family might say, well, they're all online. So why do we need to go to the cemetery? Well, I could go to find a grave and I did a search for Lemuel Shattuck dying in 1859. And sure enough, I found an entry for him. But this entry was essentially just including the family portrait. It doesn't include his gravestone photograph. So it was quite strange to find only partial information and not the stone itself. So I'm hoping to go out there this fall and finally photograph his gravestone. So yeah, I guess I do need to go visit the cemetery to see this and to transcribe it. Here's the actual portrait of Lemuel Shattuck, his wife and his daughters that hangs at NEHGS. Incidentally, if you ever wanna see our ghost, the bush in between the two daughters in the middle was once his son-in-law who was painted out of the picture. And on very humid days, the eyes of the son-in-law will peer out from behind the bushes. But in 30 years I've worked here, I've never seen them yet. I also did a search for Lemuel on billion graves and didn't find him there too. So I guess I have to go to the Mount Auburn Cemetery this fall. And since I love cemeteries, it's not really such a big deal. But I'm going to definitely have my cemetery map when I go. Knowing where plots are in the cemetery for your work to transcribe them may help you. You may want to work section by section row by row and be able to mark off your work on a cemetery map. That way you're not duplicating your efforts. Also find out what's already been done on find a grave and billion graves. Why not uh, go out and collaborate? Maybe a group from your local genealogical organization, church, or some of your friends get together and tackle such a large project. And of course, it's always good to check with the cemetery office and tell them what you're doing as well. At NEHCS, we have plenty of transcriptions that last over centuries, but we also have gravestone photography as some of these early 20th century gravestones capture such detail in a gravestone that may not be half as clear anymore. Microfilm and microfiche is something that we've had long at NEHGS. More and more things are being digitized, but we do have collections such as the Maidel Cemetery Association gravestone inscriptions, the Hale Index of inscriptions for Connecticut, the Corbin Collection for Western Massachusetts, as well as microfiche for monumental inscriptions in Great Britain. And remember, some of those death records you've looked at, ever see where the source is? Some of those New Hampshire and Vermont vital records, when they were requesting them in the early 20th century, the town clerks didn't have the records in a lot of cases, but the cemeteries did. They copied deaths and births from the old gravestones. Now, what I want to show you now is uh, my favorite website of all time is AmericanAncestors.org and show you where you can find some of these inscriptions if you're a member of NEHGS. We also encourage you to sign up as a guest member as well if you're not. So in American Ancestors, I'm going to go over to search the A to Z list of databases. From here, we have 490 databases with over a billion searchable records. From here, I can go down to a specific type, vital records, including Bible, cemetery, and church records. From there, I get 294 databases, but I'm gonna narrow it down even further by going into my keyword search and typing in cemetery. When I do that, I now have 40 databases. The one I'd like to show you uh, is one that covers for all of North American cemetery transcriptions we've put on so far from our manuscript collection, which we have over 28 million manuscripts. I clicked here. I'm just going to simply put in my own last name. And I'm able to find 
a variety of different transcriptions that are available. So if I clicked in here into Livingston Lambert, who's not an ancestor of mine, I can get both the transcription verbatim uh, details here, as well as looking at the original page from our collection here. What the nice thing is it has your pagination, as well as up top here, it gives you the actual manuscript call number. So hope you have some time to explore that. We also have other databases on American ancestors, including one that you may find useful. Pull back out of here. Going back to our list of cemetery databases, we have a variety of different ones. One of them, uh, which is a wonderful collaboration, is for Jewish gravestones in Massachusetts, part of the Jewish Cemetery Association with gravestones that date from 1875 to 2012. And if I just put in a name that I've searched recently, I could find details such as not an inscription image or a copy of a transcription, but the detail right here, because this is no images in this database, but the details. Jenny Levine, buried in 1968 in West Roxbury at the section of the Baker Street Cemetery called the Sons of Abraham uh, that she's engraved for, section P, left-hand side. And then the source is on page 379. All right, go back to the lecture here. And some other sources in NEHS that are often looked for cemetery research besides transcriptions, funeral home records. We have some funeral home records uh, that may be transcribed or maybe even uh, a form that you may have uh, come across in our manuscript collection. We have newspapers both on microfilm as well as early American newspapers and access to newspapers.com and 19th century newspapers. If you're a member of NEHGS, our external databases extend you the early American newspapers and the 19th century newspapers, as well as the Boston Globe uh, for on your subscription from our external databases link. We have manuscripts of family papers. As a genealogist, you've probably gone out and transcribed gravestones in your past, or hopefully have influenced you to do it now. These manuscripts would have been done maybe 50 to 100 years ago, maybe in that transcription of family papers, they've transcribed those gravestones so you can't read anymore. Published genealogies often have transcribed gravestones as well. Probate records will make indication of the gravestone purchase and maybe who carved it. And deed records, why would that be important? Well, your ancestor may not be buried in that central cemetery by the churchyard. He could have been buried in his own backyard. Knowing the deed that says, please do not plow the back corner of that plot because that is where my family cemetery is may be a valuable clue when looking for your family cemeteries in your ancestral towns. And of course, what have you used? I'm sure there's a variety of different things that you've done. Don't forget, besides any HGS, looking in your local town historical societies and public libraries is a good resource as well. But I hope that you can find some treasure in what I've introduced today from the archives of any HGS and our online collections. At this point, I'm going to turn back over to my colleague, Kathleen. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that was a great overview, a lot of great information there. Uh, as mentioned, there is a syllabus available for sale outlining the information that David covered in his presentation. Uh, you'll find a link to that in the reminder emails as well as the follow-up email. Um, and I also included it in answers to a couple of the questions that we had uh, during the presentation as well. Uh, before we get to your questions, I want to let you know about some events that we have coming up. Uh, on October 11th, uh, Adam Hochschild will be discussing his book, American Midnight, The Great War, A Violent Peace, and Democracy's Forgotten Crisis. This book covers the years of 1917 to 1921 in America, a forgotten yet crucial window between World War I and the Roaring Twenties. Uh, this month, we are also hosting an in-person event at our Boston Research Center called Heraldry and the Heralds. Peter O'Donohue, York Herald at Her Majesty's College of Arms in London, will be presenting on the history of heraldry and the heralds from the 12th century to the present day. Uh, later this month, we're also hosting an online seminar uh, called Uncovering Hidden Histories, Compiling Biographies of People Omitted from the Written Record. 
Participants will be receiving more than two hours worth of instructive videos and other educational materials, as well as a 90 minute live conversation and Q&A with our panel of experts. Um, and members will uh, save 10% on this one as well. Uh, finally, on October 20th, David is going to be joining us again for another great presentation, uh, this time on verifying descent from Salem's accused witches. You can learn all about these events and others at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. All right, and so we can get into some of your questions, uh, a lot of great questions here. Um, so first, David, we had a great question submitted by Rebecca. Um, which is how do you approach discrepancies between information found on headstones versus cemetery records and death records? Well, the first record in any case you want to look at is the death record. Um, that's obviously going to be recorded well before the burial record, in most cases, and probably way before the gravestone is purchased. Um, gravestones will historically have errors. I've seen many of them that have... <laughs> been filled in or recarved over. Uh, my own great grandfather's gravestone has him dying in 1920 and being born in 1849. Well, when that stone was carved, uh, they forgot to uh, check that he was born in 1848 and died the following year in 1921. So he had already been uh, dead a year by the time that stone had been recorded. So the the, the idea of looking at records is to understand that to err is human. Um, looking at the official death record is going to give you something that was done closest to the time, the primary source of the event. Burial records should be considered second, also a primary source. The idea is that obviously their burial record will be a different date, unless they died of smallpox or were buried the same day for whatever reason. The date should differ a little bit. The date on the gravestone should be the date of death and not the date of burial. So it shouldn't align with the cemetery or church sexton's record. So again, death records first, burial records second, and looking at your discrepancy on a gravestone carving, it could be an error. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so let's see, we also had a lot of questions submitted about how to uh, handle headstones that are very hard to read or that have been worn away. Um, what recommendations would you have for that? Well, the pre previous presentation I have just given, <laughs> I'll give you one clue, uh, looking at old transcriptions. And that's why I think some of the treasures at NEHS we have here at 99101 Newbury Street and also available on American Ancestors will answer that for you. Because you can look at a transcription, Kathleen, that was done in 1875 for a cemetery, you know, 150 almost 150 years ago, practically, and then look at the gravestone now and it may be worn away. Marble gravestones uh, have really taken a battering in, um, over the course of years, and they've sugared away, worn away. Um, the stone may have broken, so knowing an old transcription is helpful. Now, if the stone is still standing, uh, one of the tricks that I use is waiting for a clear day with the lighting, because a shadow cast, even in the most faintest of inscriptions, may be caught, and you might be able to read it. Also, one of the tricks that people have used for years, large mirrors, casting the light when you can't wait for the sun to be at the right angle. And that sometimes helps you understand what the stone is and, you know, bring another set of eyes. Transcribing and trans, uh, going through graveyards is always fun with company. Great. All right, and um, we also have a question here uh, from Ron, who is going to be visiting a cemetery that's in poor condition, mm -hmm. um, and he's wondering if there would be a record of plot purchases or something like that so that he might be able to go there and locate um, the location of toppled stones. Sure. So the first thing you want to do is obviously before you visit is call the town hall uh, or the city hall and find out who is the caretaker for that cemetery? Now, if you have trouble getting hold of the town hall, the next thing I would do is contact a local funeral home in that community because they're going to definitely know who to be in touch with, especially if they have a burial that has to occur there. Knowing who the caretaker is might be just uh, a lady or a gentleman who has the records at home, 
with a map, uh, with the burial records. It not, doesn't necessarily have to be a beautiful office that stands on the grounds of the cemetery. It also could be at the basement of the town hall or any parks and recreations department uh, somewhere in the community that has index cards and a map. So do a little digging ahead of time, no pun intended, uh, and you should probably be able to dig up some good information. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. We also had a couple of questions about find a grave. Mm -hmm. um, so one attendee here uh, mentioned that sometimes he'll come across find a grave entries where there's no tombstone uh, pictured there and um, he can't find any record of the person being buried there, but it's on find a grave. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone else mentioned that uh, kind of the opposite thing where sometimes there will be an image of a tombstone, um, but there will also be a lot of additional information on find a grave that isn't reflected on the tombstone photo itself. Um, okay. So I guess what we're getting at is kind of how reliable is the information on find a grave? How should that be approached? I'll give you a case of so find a grave or billion graves. Um, you have the availability of putting in a memorial. So the memorial may be for someone who doesn't have a gravestone. So it's not always necessary that there is an image of a gravestone. It's to memorialize the person. That being said, some people are a little overzealous in their assumptions. Um, I can tell you that in the case of one of my colonial families, uh, back in the 1950s, somebody uh, filed temple ordinance work at the family history library who is, he thought the parents were based on a conjecture using the same name for the father as the person. So Mr. Daniel Poor. Uh, if you go to find a grave, you'll find an entry uh, for this fictional set of parents buried somewhere in Massachusetts. Uh, and they never came over, let alone have any name associated to it. So no fault of the person who did it. It's a trickle down mistake. Also, I have cemeteries that I've done transcriptions for. I've gone corner to corner, these small colonial cemeteries in my hometown. And I photographed everything, everything that's still standing. I've even found some that were broken and photographed those. So case closed, cemetery is not open anymore. It's the done deal. I'll go back a year later and I'll find there are like 10 or 15 requests for cemeteries because people have uh, photographs in that cemetery because people assume that's where their ancestor is buried in. Well, it's one thing to make the assumption based upon a burial record or a newspaper article or maybe even a family diary or letter, but it's one thing to just plop your ancestor virtually into a cemetery. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people are doing. So be careful of that. As far as the uh, extra information, well, again, it's not on the gravestone, but what you want to keep in mind is we saw that inscription I did earlier with a person that even put down who the parents were on an adult's gravestone and who his parents, when his parents married before he was born, that wouldn't typically be on a stone. Sometimes the find a grave and billion graves will include photographs of the person, maybe in a photograph of the obituary uh, of their home. Um, there's any number of things, which I think is a positive thing. Uh, what I always tell, if you find something online on find a grave or billion graves, the person who submitted that information is available for you to contact. And if you feel the information is an error or you're just curious what the source is because they didn't put a citation down, I'll contact them. Okay, well, thank you again, David. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to leave it there because we're getting into overtime here. Um, but thank you everyone for your thoughtful questions. Um, I know that we had a lot that we couldn't get to. Um, so you may consider hiring our research services team if you would like research done on your behalf. Um, or you can also chat with our genealogists for free online Tuesday through Saturday at 9 to 5 Eastern time. Uh, we also have extended hours on Wednesday evenings from 9 to 8 p.m. Uh, this is a great free service available to the public. Um, it can help you uh, with your general reference questions, advice on how to proceed with your research, and any other questions you have that can be answered in a 15-minute window. Uh, that service is available, again, for free at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. You will have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on today's webinar. Uh, as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any feedback is very helpful and appreciated. 
This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more. Thank you again, and I hope to see you all at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.